Uh, pause this, go get a dice, roll it, and as soon as you get a six, you're going to start watching this again. Uh, thanks very much for watching. This is always be rolling how board games can change your life and save the world. Uh, my name is James. I like games. I'm from Birmingham, England, and some of this presentation is in my native dialect. We shall start with a question. What am board games? What am they? Well, according to Wikipedia, a board game is a large underwater mammal that eats mainly plankton. Hmm. Citation needed. And this bothers board gamers like me because this is inaccurate. And if there's one thing we board gamers like, apart from board games, it's accuracy. In fact, if we were going to write a list of all the other things that board gamers like, the number one thing on that list would be accuracy. The number two thing on that list would be pointing out inaccuracies. It very much ties in with the first. And that's why this video has a comment section, so that you can point out all the inaccuracies in the show. And through that process, this will become the most accurate show on the internet. In fact, what I've done is I've put some intentional inaccuracies in the show just to see if you're paying attention. Uh, the third thing on our list is zombies. Now, don't write a comment just yet. Yes, that is an intentional one. It shouldn't, of course, be that. Let's get rid of that. It should, of course, be... Zombies. Ah, it was a double bluff. Uh, let's give it to that as well. Should of course be, there we go. Everybody check that now. We're all happy, let's move on. The fourth thing that we like, we like the tangibility of physical objects. And the fifth thing we like is, uh, well, lists. Uh, if you go to a board gamer's website, mainly consists of lists that they've made of their favourite board games and then lists of those lists. Uh, it turns out there's a huge crossover between people who like board games and people who like lists, as can be shown by this Venn diagram. There you go, there you've got the uh, subsection AB, very much the largest subsection. If you add into that people who like Venn diagrams as well, ABC very much the largest section there. Here's a list of reasons why we like Venn diagrams. They're uh, more niche graphical representation and therefore better. Uh, it proves we were listening in maths and circles remind us of beautiful game counters. So I consider myself to be a board game player and at least in 2014 when I wrote this, telling people that felt like I was confessing to some dark secret. Why is that? Why do board games have such a bad reputation? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons. Reason number one, the games we grow up playing are at best naff and at worst plain evil. I mean, what's the first game most kids play when they're growing up? It's this one, isn't it? Uh, snakes and Ladders. Not known as Snakes and Ladders throughout the world, though. Of course, in America, it's known as Shoots and Ladders, because, hey, they've got to get shooting into everything. Well, shoot is just the American word for what we British would call a slide. And uh, that makes loads more sense, doesn't it? Slides and ladders than Snakes and Ladders, because we've all seen people travelling down a slide, haven't we? But... Uh, who have we ever seen travelling down a snake other than John Voight in the movie Anaconda? Now, mathematicians have analysed that it takes, on average, 39.6 rolls of the dice to get your counter from square number one all the way up to square number 100, taking into account all the snakes and the ladders that you might encounter along the way. So it stands to reason, if you do better than this average, you're probably going to win. If you do worse, you're probably going to lose, but it's going to take you the best part of 40 rolls of the dice per player just to work out who was the luckiest. Why don't you just toss a coin at the beginning and get it over with? Also, what are we teaching our kids with this game? We're teaching them that no decision they make will have any effect on the outcome of their own lives. Another game that suffered from this problem when I was growing up is this. Uh, the game of life, known in the States as just life. Uh, you start the game by leaving university and then you have to get one of six jobs. You either have to be a journalist, an engineer, a lawyer, a scientist, a teacher or an architect. And then you have to get married and it has to be to someone of the opposite sex and you have to have children as well. It's a very prescribed view of life, uh, isn't it? Well, it just so happens that uh, I, I am married and it is to someone of the opposite sex and I do have children and I'm going to be very disappointed if either of those children don't end up with one of those six jobs. But I can't help but feel that this game is somehow responsible for that mindset. If I was designing a game called The Game of Life for children, it would look like this. It's just an empty box, kids. Work it out for yourselves. 
Now, it's all very well me slagging off games that people know and love. Uh, what I should do is come up with some alternatives that I think are better. So here are three excellent games for young kids. Number one, Forbidden Island. A cooperative game where you are adventurers trying to get treasures off an island before it sinks into the sea. There's Dobble, a game which kids find easy and adults find difficult. And for really young kids, you can play Doodlebugs, a game you can play with as kids as young as three. Do, however, make sure they are kids you are already acquainted with. You cannot just show up to nursery school saying, hi, can the three-year-olds play with my doodlebugs? If you're slightly older and you want something in the roller dice and move a piece genre, I would suggest this excellent French motor racing game, Formula Day. Now, it's totally easy to get completely into Formula Day, as this genius proves. I first encountered this game uh, by watching a YouTube show called uh, Tabletop, hosted by Will Wheaton. Do you remember Will Wheaton? He was a child star, he was in Stand By Me, and went on to play Shut Up Wesley Crusher on Star Trek The Next Generation. He showed up a bunch in The Big Bang Theory, and he had a show on YouTube where him and his Hollywood mates played board games. Now, my wife thinks I'm obsessed with Will Wheaton, and that I'm trying to be exactly like him. Really? I don't see it myself. Scrabble! How could I possibly have a problem with Scrabble? Look, Scrabble's fine, but it's an area control game dressed up as a numbers game, dressed up as a word game. If you've ever played Scrabble with someone who's good at Scrabble, they know a whole bunch of other words that we don't know just because they're good words to know if you play a lot of Scrabble. All the two-letter words are all the words that have a Q but no U, and I think, in a friendly game, it's against the spirit of things to play words that you don't normally use. It's words like this, cat and chi, words they don't know the meaning of. But to arm you guys, I'm going to tell you the meanings. Uh, cat, that's a type of Middle Eastern chewing tobacco, and that's uh, middle class mock the week. Here's a real Scrabble tile that is commercially available. The number three appears to be worth five points. What's going on there? Uh, no, there's no number Scrabble, uh, because well, no one would ever challenge you, would they? No, this is from uh, Russian Scrabble, there you go. Because, of course, every language and dialect has its own version of Scrabble. Uh, in fact, my own native Birmingham, we have our own version of Scrabble, Brummy Scrabble. It's exactly the same as regular English Scrabble, only instead of five different vowels, there's just kind of one. It's that kind of uh, noise that we make, uh, and that's worth a couple of three points. Guess Who, a game I still regard with great fondness. This is the original 1979 lineup of Guess Who. Not the most diverse bunch, I grant you. Um, in fact, it looks less like a board game and more like a, a Brexit party rally. I do like Guess Who, despite the flaws in the gameplay. There's one character in Guess Who, and if you draw that card, you are going to lose, and it is Claire. And it is not, it is not Claire's fault, okay? She just fulfills too many of the niche groups within Guess Who. She's got ginger hair, glasses, hat. She's a woman, which in 1979 was this really niche thing to be. And that's four niches, and no one comes close to having as many as four niches, as can be proved by this Venn diagram, which was a completely legitimate way for me to spend an afternoon. But what I like about Guess Who is that the fun element of the game depends entirely on how creative the players want to be. You could ask the questions that everyone asks, have they got brown hair? Have they got a moustache? Or you could ask questions that no one's ever asked before. Like, is this person upset because they've been attacked by a chocolate cake? Or has this person got a giant gherkin on their head? Or is this person inexplicably wearing chainmail? Or has this person's head got the dimensions of a cricket bat? Or is this man depressed because someone showed up to the fancy dress party in a better Frank Sinatra costume than he's got? You can even speculate about their lives beyond the game. Does this person work as a maitre d' in a restaurant? They clearly do, don't they? Alex in the French, Max in the Italian. Was this person the star of art movies in the 1970s? Blatantly. When my brother and I were teenagers, we took a train journey from where we live in Birmingham down to London. And to while away the hour and a half, we took a copy of Travel Guess Who with us. Uh, we found ourselves at a table, sat opposite each other and started to play. Now, in one of the early games, it became quite obvious that I was about to lose. 
My brother had it down to the last two. I still had half of my people standing up and I was pondering my next move when I started to feel this incredible pressure on the toes of my left foot. I thought, that's odd. I mean, there was a guy sitting next to my brother, but it was just some stranger reading a newspaper. But on the back of the newspaper, in Byron, was written the word George. Hmm. I didn't lose another game on that train journey. I would intentionally get myself into losing positions and then always come up with a miraculous guess at the last minute. I never found out who that man was, but if you're watching this, thank you. Here's a version of Guess Who that you won't have ever seen before because I own the only copy. Uh, it was made for my wife and I on the occasion of our wedding by some friends of ours, and it features as the characters the faces of our friends and family. And these aren't old photos or photos taken off Facebook. These have been specifically taken for this game so that there are members of our family wearing hats and beards that they don't ordinarily have. And because it's people that we know, we can ask questions that only we know the answers to. Like, uh, is this someone we only pretend to like? I think if you've got the time and the inclination, this is a really nice gift you can give someone. And from something sweet to something evil. Did you know the world record for the longest ever game of Monopoly took 1,680 hours to play? And to put that into some context for you, that's 10 hours longer than a normal game of Monopoly takes. Didn't start off life as Monopoly though. When it started it was called the Landlord's Game. It looked like this. It was invented by this woman, uh, Elizabeth McGee Smith, and she invented the Landlord's Game to help to explain to her friends the inner workings of land value tax. Woo! Because there ain't no party like a land value tax explaining party. And then in the 20s, this man came along, Charles Darrow, and he uh, borrowed the idea and turned it into Monopoly, made a fortune from his invention, uh, but then sadly lost it all when he had to repair all of his houses and hotels for no reason. Do you want to see something that no one's ever seen before? Okay, here it is. The Rule Book of Monopoly. Yeah, no one reads the Rule Book, do they? You don't need to. When you first play it, someone explains the rules to you. And thanks to the Chinese whispers of history, a lot of rules were left out or put in that weren't in the original book. Uh, you, do you play the version where all the money from the fines go in the middle of the board and when you land on just parking you get the... Yeah, that was never in the rules of Monopoly. I mean, they've added it now as an optional rule uh, because they know full well that no one is reading the rule book. I have read the rule book. I was shocked to find this genuine extract. We know no one is reading this, so we can put whatever we want. You'll play it once, have a massive row, and then stick it in the loft to forget about it. Then in about five years... You'll give it to a charity shop who will put it next to a chess set made of shot glasses. I'm joking, of course. Here is a genuine extract from the rules, though. Whenever you land on an unknown property, you may buy that property from the bank at its printed price. We know that much. But if you don't, the banker sells it at auction to the highest bidder. You've got to believe me, in 2014, that was a revelation. Obviously, now loads of people know that rule exists because of the app and the computer game. But even with that, about 50% of people don't play this rule. And that rule does speed things up a bit. But it also means that everyone just panic buys early on in the game. Everyone just buys everything that they land on. Which means whoever lands on the best stuff is going to win. And it's going to take you the best part of three hours to play out that eventuality. Also, if you're playing with more than one other person, someone's going to be out after about 20 minutes and have nothing to do. And these things all contravene my fun game checklist. It's a very simple three-part checklist to find out if a game is fun or not. Uh, number one, can you explain the rules in five minutes? Keep it simple. Uh, number two, is it over in an hour? I mean, come on, guys, we're all, we're all busy. I mean, obviously, we're not at the moment, are we? Because we're watching this. And number three, are all the players still in until the end of the game? Incidentally, my fun game checklist also doubles up as my sexy time checklist, or at least it did until my wife took my clipboard away. But my main issue with Monopoly is the mentality behind the game. Because the rules of Monopoly say I'm only allowed to win 
if everyone else has nothing. It's not enough for me just to have the most. Everyone else must also have nothing. And I think that's a potentially harmful lesson to teach children about capitalism. But there are people who will say, yes, but that's how the world is and you can't shelter your children from it. In that case, the game doesn't go far enough. Uh, let's have a rule where you work out who's got the richest dad and they get a few more goes around the board at the start before anyone else. How about that? Let's have a rule where the banker can just bail themselves out whenever they feel like it and never go to jail. And let's have a rule where no one under 40 can buy a house. But despite all that, Monopoly was a huge success, as you know, in pretty much every country in the developed West, apart from Germany. Because in the 30s, Monopoly was banned by the Nazis. Uh, because apparently Jesse Owens kept showing up and kicking their ass at it. Jesse Owens there, running for Oiho State. Now, about 25 years ago, a game was released it's a bit like Monopoly in that you roll dice, you build stuff on a board, you do deals with other players, and I think it's better than Monopoly in almost every way. And when that game was released, that game was called The Settlers of Catan. Now, if you've never heard of Catan before, I already guarantee you this, you don't want to play it. Because it's called The Settlers of Catan. It's, it's just got a name that screams nerd, hasn't it? You, you hear Settlers of Catan and you think, oh God, I've got to dress up as a wizard to play. And you don't, you really, you, well, you don't have to. The Settlers of Catan, not to be confused with the Kettlers of Satan. That's a different thing. I mean, now it's just called Catan, but they had an opportunity there to make it sound more exciting. Didn't they? they could have said the Adventurers of Catan or the Pioneers of Catan, but no, they went with the settlers. Yeah, we're just going to Catan just, just, just so we can go and get settled. We're going to have a quiet night in, in Catan. If you think the name's bad, wait until you see what the box used to look like. I mean, what's going on there? These three look like they've had a massive row. It's not a good image for a board game box, is it? It doesn't look like a fun game, does it? It looks like a Watchtower magazine. And this brings me to point number two. Why do board games have a bad reputation? Because modern games have no idea how to market themselves to normal people. Now, I went through one of those lists of best board games on the internet, and I took pictures of some of the boxes. I'm going to show them to you now. Feel free to stop me if you want to play any of them. I mean, what's fun there? I mean, yes, there's a photo bombing sheep, but... Uh, in fact, he's something of a recurring motif, because he shows up on this one as well, hey! Next to the alcoholic, depressed peasant that just screams, fun for all the family. What's this then? Well, it appears to be uh, some kind of merchant from the old days, sitting in his office, with a look on his face as if to say, Steve, Steve, are you, are you drawing a picture of me? Well, don't get the bong in shot. My parents might see this. That's a depressed man looking at a map. Now, if you prefer your historical figures looking at maps slightly camper, there's this guy. Clearly pointing out where he's going to be fabulous. Merchant from the olden days looking annoyed, standing in front of a boat. Merchant from the olden days looking annoyed, standing in front of a boat. Merchant can't even be bothered to be in the shot on this one. It's just his hand and his hat. Well, it turns out this must be something else that we board gamers like. We must like merchants from the olden days looking annoyed and standing in front of stuff. Which would explain why when Avengers Endgame came out and fans and critics alike said it was a satisfying and enjoyable ending to the franchise, it left us board games completely cold and all they had to do was that. And we'd have been all about it. Carcassonne. I love Carcassonne. Games are fun, it's easy to learn, they don't take very long, and none of that enjoyment comes across from this box. Although, to be fair, this is the first edition box. Uh, the second edition, now that looked like this. It's a world of difference, isn't it? Now, I'm lucky, I live in Birmingham, which is not a sentence you hear very often, but only because we're the hosts of the UK Games Expo, the country's biggest board game convention. And it takes place over the bank holiday weekend at the end of May, because if there's something else board gamers like, it's being inside on a hot day. And back in 2014, the UK Games Expo was the home of the UK Carcassonne Championships. 
and I was in that. Thank you very much. You do have to get through a pretty rigorous qualifying process of paying six pounds and showing up. Look, I'll be honest, I entered it as a bit of a joke. I knew I was going to write this show and I thought, well, I might get a story out of this about how, you know, everyone took it way too seriously and I was completely out of my depth. And uh, so I sat down at the first table, joining us three random strangers, and everyone was really nice. And between us, we played a lovely game of Carcassonne, and I won it. It's like brilliant! I won, I won the first round. Well done, me. Uh, so then you you put on another table with another three strangers, and I sat down for round number two. And I could already sense that probably things weren't going to go as well for me as in round number one. Uh, this is one of my opponents from that second game, a lovely bloke, his name is uh, Kieran, uh, top bloke there. You notice the bloke in red, by the way, that's the tournament referee uh, trying to photobomb. And we all know that's not how you photobomb, is it? That's how you photobomb. Anyway, one of the clues that Kieran was about to hand my ass to me at Carcassonne was that, well, the playing pieces in Carcassonne are these little wooden men uh, called meeples. And Kieran had bought his own custom meeples from home, and they looked like this. Yeah, Stormtrooper meeples. Uh, note the pyramid formation, uh, that's because when I said, Kieran, can I take a photo of your meeples, please? He said, yeah, sure thing. Would you like me to put them in a pyramid for you? Yes, I would. Yes, please. Lovely man, Kieran. And very gracious in victory he was too. I lost that game by quite a bit. Uh, I played two other games though in the tournament, uh, one of which I won. Uh, so when they totaled it all up at the end, it turns out I was seventh. I was the seventh best Carcassonne player in the United Kingdom. Uh, who wants my autograph? There's an interesting postscript to that story. Um, I was booked by UK Games Expo to do the show at UK Games Expo 2015. And while I was there, I thought I'm going to enter the competition again anyway, because I had a lovely time. And I did, and I won! I had to go to Germany to represent the United Kingdom in the World Carcassonne Championships. There's me, there's my badge, there's me meeting the game designer, and I came uh, 25th uh, there out of, um, well, out of 7 billion. Anyway, enough showing off, back to the show. So this is what Catan looks like these days. It's a little bit better, isn't it? It looks a bit more like a, a bran-filled breakfast cereal. And one of the things I should have mentioned about Catan is that it's German. Board games are huge in Germany. Maybe it was because Monopoly was banned that Monopoly never got the monopoly on board gaming in Germany, so they carried on inventing games. Or maybe just German TV is not very good. Now Catan's a point scoring game. It's, it's first to ten, which means that it's possible for all the players to be on sort of eight or nine at the same point, and it'd be genuinely exciting, something you don't get in Monopoly. Also, players who manage to do trades and deals with other players, they tend to do really well. And anyone who hoards resources to themselves is punished by the game. Hmm. A game where everyone can have a lot, and maybe some people get a bit more. A game where fair trading is rewarded, and where hoarding is punished. Hmm. This is the game the Germans have been playing for 25 years. How's their economy doing? Oh, pretty good, isn't it? Oh, but I suppose they're not very good at competitive sport. Do remember I wrote this in 2014. And of course, they have exquisite taste in music. So what's a guy to do? Well, the one thing Monopoly has always been better at is marketing. They know they can come up with a version of Monopoly for every uh, town, every hobby, every interest. You know, if you've got a kid who supports a Liverpool football club, you can get Liverpool football club edition Monopoly. Uh, there's the car. And just teasing Liverpool, enjoy your Premier League trophy. Here are some versions of Monopoly that are commercially available. Family Guy, Moshi Monsters, One Direction Monopoly. I thought all Monopoly was One Direction. Don't worry though, Catan have seen this and have gone, well this is clearly a clever way for us to expand our customer base and to reach out to new people who ordinarily would be put off by a game that looks like this. And do you know what they came up with? What was the point of that? That's not reaching out to a different customer base, is it? That's the same customer base. Look at the Venn diagram, it's the same people. Look at the list of things we like. Number eight is Star Trek. 
not Enterprise. Since I first wrote this show, Catan have come out with a, a new version of their game, though, haven't they? <sighs> they haven't learnt a bloody thing. This is a Catan board. And if you're British and of a certain age, this should kind of remind you of something. Yes, that's right. The old, uh, the old quiz show Blockbusters. Remember that? Yeah, it looks a bit similar, doesn't it? And do you remember in Blockbusters, there was always a hilarious joke that never got old. Do you remember? Can I have a pee, please, Bob? But <laughs> well, there's a joke just like that built into the gameplay of Catan. Yeah. Here are your resources for Catan. You've got your bricks, your wood, your sheep, your wheat and your iron. At some point in every game, someone will say, I've got wood for sheep and it never gets old. So we're building up a list of awesome gateway games. These are the games that will eventually lead you on to the harder stuff. Catan and Carcassonne I've talked about. I would like to also add this game, Ticket to Ride. This is uh, the European edition. The artwork is beautiful. It's a very fast moving game. Your go comes round really quickly. So there's hardly any sort of waiting for other people to have their turn. There's Pandemic, which is way more topical than I'm comfortable with. But it's great because it's a team game. You're all on the same side trying to eradicate diseases. So that means you all win or you all lose. So if you know people prone to tantrums, this is a good game to play with them. Now what I like about Dixit is that uh, I think some people think that board games reward only a very sort of statistical analytical frame of thinking, whereas Dixit genuinely rewards empathy and artistic interpretation. It's my oldest daughter's favourite game to play. By the way, if you are going to get any of these games, you will need a console. But you've probably already got one and people to play with. And that can be a problem, particularly if, like me, you're in your late twenties. I wasn't even in my late twenties when I wrote that joke. Now, I am growing my own players. I've got children. And I am trying to get some of my friends into board games and maybe have a board game night at my house and they can come round and we'll have a laugh and play a game. And that's happened a few times. In order to get other comedians to play with me, I've turned it into a show called Board Game Smackdown, which you can watch here on YouTube. And the other person that I played games with was my dad. What I used to do is go around on a Wednesday and we'd have some lunch and then he'd say, have you got a game with you? And uh, I'd say yes, and then we'd learn it and we'd play it. But really, it was a way for us two men to bond in a way I don't think we'd ordinarily have had the chance. Now, unfortunately, earlier this year, my dad didn't pass away, which means this ending has no emotional impact whatsoever. Sorry about that, he stubbornly refuses to die. But the good thing is I still get to play games with my dad. Now if you have that opportunity with anyone in your life, I urge you to grab it with both hands while you can. Now the show's nearly done guys, thanks for sticking with it. Now what I would say is that uh, when I did this show up in Edinburgh, it was always free for people to come and watch this show. It was part of the free festival. Uh, because there are shows in Edinburgh, done by you know comedians you've not heard of, that are charging £10 a ticket. I don't know about you, that's a lot of money. You, that's what you get for coming second in a beauty contest. So I don't want to charge a ticket price for this show. However, I do have a Patreon. If you've enjoyed this show, if you'd like to see more of this kind of content, we've got a whole bunch of videos of Board Game Smackdown up on the YouTube channel as well. Uh, you can go to patreon.com slash boardgamesmackdown from as little as $3 a month. You can help more of this content happen. Now, it's the only way to get one of these Board Game Smackdown badges as well, by the way. So the last thing we're going to do in the show, uh, I've asked everyone who's seen the show to do this. It's easy when you're in an audience with other people doing it, and I know you're probably watching this at home, but you can still do it anyway. It's called The Pledge. All you've got to do is take your hand and stick it on wherever you think your heart is, and then just read the words that are on the screen. Uh, I'll do it too so you don't feel silly. In the presence of a photo of Will Wheaton's judgmental face, I... State your name. Don't say state your name. Don't say don't say state your name. And so on. Come on guys, jump back on board. We'll finish this together. Here we go. Pledge that I will play games in a spirit of friendly competition. That I will play to win, but not be upset if I don't. That I will go home and burn any copy of Monopoly we have lying around and get a game featuring a grumpy merchant, and that I will play more games with my friends to strengthen the bonds of friendship 
and because dinner parties are tedious. That's the end of the show, guys. Thank you very much for watching. My name's James. I like games, and hopefully now you do too.